Good evening, everyone. Um, let me just switch over presentations here. And I have a lot of material to cover, so I'm, I might go at a fairly quick pace through this. Um, so please stop me if I've gone past a subject that you want to hear more about. It will make it that much longer. However, I will accommodate your request. Um, also, the people in the back, we're going to be looking at little tiny letters and numbers um, as we get into the debugging portion of this. So I won't be offended if you start to migrate up if you, if you need to see better. There's not much more we can do with the resolution here to, to fix that. So, noob reversing, or why a limited budget and defunct software forced me to learn this stuff. So who am I? Um, former high-level programmer and DBA, and by high-level programmer, I don't mean that I was like the super duper ultra <laughs> ultimate programmer. I meant that I haven't programmed really in assembly language or low-level code. I was mostly doing C++ and visual stuff. Former IT executive, uh, then I managed to escape and became a penetration tester. I am still and always will be a noob in many areas, but uh, I also seek knowledge in those areas. This is one. So what is reverse engineering? or reversing rather, reverse, reversing is just another term for reverse engineering for software. Uh, reverse engineering of course is just taking the lid off of something, looking inside to see how it works without having access to the design documents. The same concept can be applied to software thanks to some folks who have created some cool tools for us. But why would we ever want to reverse engineer software? There's certainly a negative stigma associated with the reverse engineering uh, activities Mostly people think of people who try to crack software or create key gens so that they can pirate software. And whereas these activities certainly do uh, use or require uh, a certain amount of skill, they aren't the only reasons to uh, conduct reverse engineering of software. So why? Because it's fun. It's a puzzle. Some people like to go home and play World of Warcraft at night. Other people like to go home and tear apart malware, like Tyler. These are some of the places where you can find these fun types of reversing challenges. Cactusite.org has got a lot of great web application challenges as well as application reversing challenges. You can Google reverse me's and crack me's and you'll find a whole bunch of stuff on the internet for that. And believe it or not, I found it in certification practical exercises. And also as security geeks or IT geeks, we like to know what's going on behind the scenes of our software. Um, specifically with malware, we want to know what the intent of the malware is, we want to know what the payload is. Um, we can examine how memory corruption bugs work, how exploits based on memory corruption, corruption bugs work at human readable speed. But why else? Out of necessity. So the very first bullet here is interoperability and protocol analysis. And by that I mean, what if you're a developer who wants to create an application that needs to work with somebody else's their code? but you absolutely needed to work with that. There was a case back in the early 90s, before some of you were born, I'm sure, um, where Accolade, a game developer for many consoles back then, uh, wanted to develop for the Sega Genesis platform. And they had already taken a Sega Genesis console, an early Sega Genesis console, and took it into the reverse engineering lab, looked at three games, and from those three games in the console, put some, uh, you know, soldered some connections between the two and determined what the API structure was for that game console. They did not use any of the code from the games, nor did they steal anything from the firmware on the console. They simply documented what you would need to do to make your game work for Sega. So Sega didn't bother them. They started creating games for the Genesis, but then Sega was having licensing troubles or copyright troubles in parts of Asia. They decided to add a tiny little chunk of code onto their games that would pop up a trademark notification when you booted up their games. It also would stop the games from booting on the latest version of their consoles if you didn't have this piece. Accolade found out the hard way that their games stopped working in the new version of the console, so they sent their reverse engineers back to work, and they went in and discovered that 25 bytes of code. They couldn't quite figure out what it was doing necessarily, but they did find a, a string S-E-G-A in there, and they figured, well, this must be important. This must be why our games don't work. And sure enough, when they put that code into their games, their games again magically worked. However, when you plug an Accolade, non-licensed Accolade game, into a Sega Genesis console, you now got the licensed by Sega message that came up. Sega took exception to this and sued Accolade. Um, Accolade initially lost 
in the in the first part of the suit, but they appealed, and um, the court overturned the decision. They said that because none of Sega's functional code was used, they didn't violate copyright law, and, and also that it was good for the consumer to have this competition out there. It's a little bit more complex than that, but I'll let you research that if you like. So wh why else? We, we can evaluate the security of our own products. Why not try to reverse engineer our products and see how easy they are to crack before we send them out? I've already mentioned malware analysis and reliance on non-supported software. And here's my quote for the night. Necessity may be the mother of invention, but it's also the spawn of a limited IT budget. So my story was, back in early 2000s, I worked at a company where we had a system that managed certain types of files. I'm gonna be very vague because I'm being recorded here. It managed files for our enterprise and it was sold by vendor A. Vendor A had one piece of software developed by vendor B that just did a little transformation of the files when you exported them from this system. So it was installed by vendor A the first time. It worked for a couple of years and then the server crashed as servers do. And so we were following their instructions and their notes, their installation notes to reinstall it and we got to vendor B's piece and it gave us a challenge code when we installed it. And we thought, oh, we'll just use the same code that's in the notes here. Put it in, didn't work. Called up vendor A and they said, oh yeah, that's, it's key to your hardware. So you change hardware, you need a new activation code. No problem, send us that challenge code. We'll stick it in this little web tool they gave us and we'll give you your activation code. So you get the activation code, it's fine, running for a couple more years. And like everyone around 2007, we started to virtualize. And we decided, oh, we're just gonna blow that old server away and virtualize and we'll do the same thing we did to reactivate the, the software. So we called vendor A and said, hey, we need our activation code. And vendor A said, silence. Um, we don't use that piece of software anymore. Oh, well, what's my option? Well, we have a new version of our software that doesn't use that function that you can buy from us for X amount of dollars. Oh, sorry, it's not an option for me right now. What's my other option? Well, you can contact vendor B and see if they can help you. Contacted vendor B. Vendor B's answer was, as you might guess, oh, we don't support that software anymore, but we have a solution for you. We have a brand new suite of tools that you can buy from us for the net sum of your entire year's IT software budget. So, hung up the phone, went into despair, head desk, wondering how I'm gonna tell my boss this car that we were driving along suddenly didn't have an engine, and why. And then I thought, wait a minute, I remember seeing some demonstrations and some people doing some stuff with Ali or Ali or something or other, so I started Googling and reverse engineering and you know, I did have skills from being a hex editor of games way back in the 90s, so I figured, hey, how hard could this be? So I went to work with Google, and about three days later, with a copy of Ali Debug, I took their executable and managed to find the activation code check, bypassed it, restored our functionality for a whole year before we replaced the entire system. So that's how I got started in this. Which brings me to disclaimer number one. This is intended for educational or entertainment purposes. If you feel the need to license software that you, or to reverse software that you do not own or not given explicit permission to do so, I'd recommend you consult legal counsel and understand all of the laws. So how do we go about reverse engineering? Well, the first thing we need to know is what platform we're working on because a lot of the tools are platform specific and obviously software is developed for, for certain platforms. Um, so what operating system, Windows, 32 or 64 bit. Tonight we're working with 32 bit Windows. Um, that's the Intel 32 bit architecture, CPU. So we need some tools. We need uh, disassemblers and debuggers. Tonight we're gonna be working with a Ring 3 debugger for Windows, uh, 32 bit Windows. It does not yet currently work with 64 bit Windows it's called Ali Debug. It's a very popular debugger. There are other debuggers out there in the market. Immunity makes a very good debugger that's extremely similar in functionality to Ali um, because in most part it was developed off of the Ali source code. Not reversed, it was legally required. <clears throat> you need to have a little bit of assembly language knowledge and if you don't have it, don't worry about it. Um, we'll cover some of that. You need to understand what CPU registers are, uh, a little bit about how Windows executable files are structured and how they're laid out in memory, the stack, the heap, and where the program data lives. So, mentioned assembly language. How many people here have programmed in assembly language? Wow. That was more than I thought would raise their hands. How many people have heard of assembly language before? <laughs> okay, good. 
So yes, you can code an assembly language. Um, and you should note that there isn't one single assembly language. There's a different assembly language for different platforms. But you can code, and I heard that in a galaxy far, far away, long, long ago, something like that, that there were people who actually did it. I don't know why. They would do it any longer. Um, so why is assembly language the language of reversing? Well, it's because most people today code in high-level languages that are sent through a compiling process, and the compiler likes to optimize that code for the CPU on which platform they're compiling, um, or the, the platform they're compiling for. And so what comes out of the compiler looks very different from what went in in your nice structured functions in C++. You're going to get you know, things that the compiler sticks in there. You would have no, re no reason to understand why other than to know that it's trying to use the CPU as efficiently as possible. So it'll in insert all kinds of strange instructions. <clears throat> so who can tell me what the difference between machine code and assembly language is? Because what comes out of the compiler is machine code. Well, it's a trick question. They're essentially different representations of the same thing. Um, machine code, well, uh, speaking loosely, because assembly language that you code as a programmer is not necessarily machine language, but it won't be transformed like a compiler would transform a C++ program. But assembly language is essentially the human readable representation of the machine code instructions, specifically when we're dealing with uh, a debugger and reversing and note Machine code should not be confused with microcode. They're two completely different things, different abstraction level. So, the demo. For the first demo, we're going to look at, well, there's only going to be one demo tonight. We don't really have time for any more. Um, we're going to look at a reverse me challenge that was part of a practical exercise for an industry certification test. I'm not going to tell you which one. Um, we were given an executable, and the challenge was, one, either to patch it up so that it would accept any input and give you your success message. It was a basic dialog box with a username and serial number, your basic reverse me challenge. Or two, reverse the algorithm and provide a good serial number, working serial number for a given username. So time permitting, I'll try to run through both here. But let's start with a quick overview for those of you who've never seen the, the front end of Ali Debug. It's a little uh, disconcerting. So I told you it was gonna be small. Don't worry about the detail at this point. This is just a screenshot. But I'm gonna go through the different pieces you see here. So when you first open a file in Ali Debug, you see this come up. It's the main CPU window. It's got a lot of stuff going on here. It kind of looks like my family room and my kids are done with it. Um, the upper left pane is where your disassembled executable code lives. Um, let me see if I can get my pointer over here. This first column is your virtual address <coughs> space where the program is loaded, and you'll see it will increment downward here. And the way that the code will execute inside the debugger is very similar to the old line number basic. It'll just step down through the code and you'll see some jumps, some go-tos, you know, sort of go-tos and returns. So that's the way it works and it'll follow these addresses. Um, the second column is your machine code represented in hexadecimal. Third column is the assembly language translation of that with your uh, more descriptive operands for your opcodes. They call this part the opcode, this part the operand. And your third column is your comments column. The comments column can be used by the analyst to take notes as you're uh, looking at your executable on each line of code, but you'll notice that it's already populated. And the reason that is is because Ali Debug does a really nice job of doing an initial analysis of the code looking for things like Windows API calls and the parameters passed to those. It'll look for loops and switches and put brackets around subroutines. And you can see some of those on the left over here by the machine code. Um, so it's a really nice feature for reversers if it can find these. It doesn't always find this stuff, but when it does, it's a good help. So moving on to the next uh, pane, this is your registers pane. When I talked about CPU registers, we have our eight general purpose registers in Intel architecture. Um, then we have EIP, which is the instruction pointer, which just basically just tells the CPU what the next instruction will be over here, the address of the next instruction. Um, and then we have these flags down here. You see these zeros and ones are all bit-valued flags, so they're either true or false. Question. What are those top ones again? I forgot. Uh, the general purpose registers, EAX, ECX, EDX, EBX, ESP, EBP, ESI, and EDI. Those are 32-bit general purpose registers that live on the CPU. So we're gonna talk about those for a minute. And let me just mention something about the flags. Um, the flags become important in reversing, specifically the Z flag, which we'll look at 99% of the time, and sometimes the C flag, because 
those flags will indicate to the code when there is a uh, conditional branch of the program flow. It's usually a conditional jump that happens. And it will look at those flags to see whether or not it jumps. And we'll talk about that more. So I mentioned the registers. Here's EAX. It's one of the registers. It's four bytes long or 32 bits long in the Intel 32 architecture. Um, it can be addressed as an entire 32-bit chunk, or you can address it in smaller chunks. So if we just call it AL instead of EAX in the code, we're just addressing this very first, the low byte in the lower 16 bits of the register. AH is the high order byte in the lower 16 bits of the register, and AX is the lower 16 bits in the EAX register. You'll see that later. You can I just mentioned that so you see when you see CL and AL later on, you know why it's only addressing one piece of that register. Lower right, we have our stack. And most of you, you know about programming basics. The stack is a place in RAM. It's a LIFO, lasting first out structure, um, that's used a lot for passing parameters to functions and local variables and that sort of thing. So we can follow that there. The lower left is the memory dump area. And the memory dump area is more like a hex editor type view of your disassembled binary. Um, and it's good for, let's say, if we see an address up here that we want to follow, we can follow it in the memory dump um, by various means. We'll show that later. And this tiny little pane in between is a very useful pane for reverse engineers because as we're tracing through the code, these debuggers are dynamic tools, meaning that we can start a program in it, set a breakpoint for it to freeze, and then step through the code, and that's called tracing through the code. As we trace through the code, this little pane here gives us some like ESP, some advanced information about what's going to happen in the next instruction to occur. So it'll tell us whether or not a conditional jump is going to happen, It'll tell us uh, the values of the operands that are, that are in the next um, operation so that we can it deciphers it for us so we don't have to chase it down in memory. So it's a very useful feature. So some assembly examples before we uh, move on. Just so when we see it, you'll know what we're talking about here. This is the Intel syntax. So in Intel syntax, you have an opcode, move in this case. Then you have your operands. CL is a register and 10 is a uh, is a constant, 10 hex. And in Intel syntax, you always put the source last and the destination first. So this means move 10 hex to the CL register. The, the ones in red here, and I apologize for those who are red, green, color blind. Um, the ones in red here are basically the opcodes that set those flags we talked about that are used in the conditional jumps. CMP means compare, test is test. CMP essentially does a subtraction and then sets some flags. Test does, and I missed one flag there too, it also sets the C flag. Um, test does a logical AND. And test is very often used just to see if a value is zero or not zero. This is an explicit jump. That means we always jump. This is a go-to. This is a go-to operation. Go to this address. J and Z and JE, these are two examples of conditional jumps. These are the ones that look at a certain flag, and if the flag matches a value based on what type it is, J and Z means jump if not zero, JE means jump if equal, so it means jump if the zero flag is set. And, and don't think of this as a value of zero, think of this as true and false. Because it's kind of confusing when Z flag equals zero, you think, well, it's zero. No, it's not, it's false, it's zero, it's false. And then we have our push and our pop, which are two opcodes that are used to manipulate values on and off the stack. Okay, we are gonna get to the debugger, I promise. Um, so the first thing we do when we wanna reverse something is we do some static analysis of it. Um, definitely wanna do this with malware because malware, once you get it into a debugger, can start doing some bad stuff with your system. So you wanna do static analysis. In this case, we know that it's a Windows compiled executable. Um, so we're not going to deal with that. We're just going to get it into the debugger. So what do we do when we get it into the debugger? Well, we want to run the pro program. And we can do this outside of the debugger, too. I'm just going to jump over to that so we get the screen set up. Um, we want to run the program and look for things that are clues um, that relate to your goals in reversing the software. So goal number one, to recap the goals, was to patch up the program so that it accepts any input at all and gives you your good to go message or two, reverse the algorithm and give it a good serial number. So keeping goal one in mind, let me see if I can switch over to, uh, I 
Dave, I'm going to shift around here so I can see a little bit. So we're in the debugger, and the first thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to put any breakpoints or anything in. I'm, I have opened our reverse key channel, which is executable, and I'm simply going to hit this little VCR button to run it. And there is our application. So if I just you know, put some garbage in here, we get a message box that pops up and says, wrong serial. Well, so, so what? What do we know now? Well, we have a message box, so we know that there was a call to message box that gave us an error message. We can see the text in there. We can see wrong serial, we can see invalid serial. So all of these are clues that we would make note of as a reversal. So if I put some other stuff in here, you know, you can run all kinds of tests against this. I'm gonna check, oh, what's that? We didn't get a message box that time, but we got uh, a message or a text string stuck back into our dialog box that tells us the name was too short. So we know we have, we have some user validation checks going on too. So let me close this. We're gonna restart again. These VCR buttons are nice up here. Just click that to restart it, and then click Run. It breaks at the initial entry point of your executable. So that's nice. It starts with a break, and then we can start it and run it from there. So what do we do with these clues that we've gathered by the initial analysis? Well, we want to get to places in the code that may be close to where that error message was generated and maybe close to the conditional check that says, should we give them the error or should we continue on? So there are a couple ways to do that. Um, the first way is to look for strings. It's a very popular way to do it. It's not always the best way, but in this case, it, it will work in this one. I simply right click in here and I search for all reference text strings. <laughs> Normally, when you open a real program in LEDV, you will see pages and pages of text that it detects. This is a very simple application, so it has very little text in it. And if we wanted to search through, say, say we had multiple pages and we had to scroll up, you want to scroll to the top and then do your search from here. I can search for text and it brings up the search box. Since it's all in front of us, we don't have to do that. And what do I see here? I see wrong serial. That was the text we saw in the message box. And you can see it's at this address, and this is the command that was given at that address that was pushed onto the stack, probably as a parameter to the message box function. What, do, what else do we see here? Wow, very good job and well done. Um, pretty good indicator that that's our good boy message. When we do reversing, we have our bad boys and our good boys. This is a pretty good indicator of a good boy message. Um, if I double click on any of these, it takes me right into the code where that occurred. So I can see in the code, there's the message box that's going to tell me, well done, very good job. Um, another way is to set breakpoints on API calls. We know that a message box came up with our error message. So how do we get to API calls? We can do that by searching for all intermodular calls. And when we do that, we basically get a listing of all the imported functions from system DLLs that this application is using. And I sorted them so we can see uh, in order. If we're looking for a large list, you usually want to sort them. Or you could do search as well in here. In any case, uh, we do see two message box calls here. And so you can do the same thing. I see a message box call, I want to double click to get into the code where message box is called. And there you have your wrong serial number um, message again. So we, we ended up in the same place with that method. The third method is to use the call stack. The call stack is somewhat useful, maybe not so much in this area, but I'll show it to you real quick. So you run your program, you do a check, you get, you get this error message. And when the error message comes up, or we are at a program where you see a condition that you want to examine in the debugger, you go back to your debugger, pause it, and then you click this K up here, or you can do it from the menu too, but K is the call stack. This is essentially, oh great, I've covered it all up. This is essentially the call stack of all of the subroutine calls that happen <coughs> from the bottom up um, to get us to this point in the program. And actually where we want to be is right here. If this wasn't in the way you would see reverse me dot address with the message box call. If I double click that, it takes me back into the code, but that's not the same message box we saw. What is that? Well, this happens to be right at the very end of the call, and it's a jump to uh, an address pointer for the um, system DLL call. So how do we get back to the message box call in our local code? Well, that's where this handy little pane comes in down here. You can see it's got a lot of great information for us. Local calls from these addresses. If I right click on that, I can go to right to that address, and there it is being called from that same location. So let me run that, let me get out of this again. All right. All right, 
<clears throat> Let's get back to um, our message box with the air. <coughs> so why do we why do we use these clues to get into the code? Well, as I mentioned again, you want to look around inside the code and see if there's anything else interesting going on before that error message is called. And if we start scrolling up around that message box, we see some conditional jumps. Oh, we see some other error messages. Oh, there's our name was too short message. So we can see this block right here has several little checks that it does for the user input. It validates user input, and each one of those has its own conditional jump. There's a J and B, which we didn't see before. That's jump if not below, jump if below or equal, jump if not zero, and another jump if not zero. So, if we wanted to get past these checks, we have to do something to make sure that this jump happens, that we jump over that error message. And we do that by changing the actual program code inside the debugger. So let's, let's take this case here where name is too short. We have the jump if not below, it's checking certain flags, and this nice little feature in Ollie shows you where it goes with this little arrow in the code if we're successful, if we jump past that error message. I can come in here and change JMB to JMP, J and it actually changes it in the code. So I've assembled that right into the code, and if I run, it's still running, so I should be able to, don't want to assemble there, I should be able to put something in here that's shorter than four characters, and it gets past that check, because it would have put name too short, but instead it took me to a bad serial number, so I know I got past that one check. So, um, let me see how we're how we doing on time, dude. Thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to move back through this very quickly. Um, if we wanted to use that method to find each of those user validation checks to get through this, it would be very tedious. It'd take all night here to to show you. So what I'm going to do is show you how we would look for a better way as a reverser. Remember, we found our success message, our good boy, right? It was actually down here in the code right here, well done. So how are we getting to this? Well, what if we just jump right to that message rather than going through all of those checks? So let's see where those checks start. Let's take note of this address, 401.34D. We're gonna go back up to where it does those get dialog items. So that's where it's getting your user input. Right here we have two of them. So we have one for username, one for your serial number, and then it does a refresh of the window. And then we come down here, everything's okay right now, and then we see a call. And I can guarantee you from looking at this hundreds of times that this call takes you into the initial validation checks. And it, it loops through all of those before we get to our serial number check. What if we just change this to JMP 401, what was it? I remember what that address was. 401.34D. So what if I just change that and assemble it and run the program? Any guesses as to what's going to happen? Well done. We've solved challenge number one for this. So what we would do at this point is we would come back into the debugger and we would copy to executable all modifications. We get this and copy all. <coughs> It gives us a new window, we right click and we say save file and we can give it a new name. We'll say reverse me one. And now, if I come out of this and, oops, still in there. Uh, let's see if I can find it. I'm going to show you all my secrets now. There it is. We now have a functioning cracked executable. So that's, that's the first method. But let's say we really wanted to reverse engineer this thing and get to the algorithm that's generating the serial. So let's get back into Ollie. Catch up here. So we know that the serial number check wasn't happening in the validation checks. I was just checking to make sure that what the user input was acceptable by the program. 
So it must happen sometime after you've passed all the validation checks. So let's run it and let's look at the bottom of those validation checks. So here's all our validation checks. And this is the last one before we come out and hit our invalid serials. So if we fall through this Plinko machine and end up in invalid serial, something went wrong. So what do we have above there? We have a jump if not zero, a conditional jump, and then we have a compare that's comparing a static zero to a place in memory. Hmm, where is that place in memory being set, I wonder? Probably in that call, in that subroutine. So if I oops, hit enter, it will take me to the subroutine. And this is, I'm going to put a comment in here. This is our serial check subroutine. So I'm not going to step you through this because we really don't have time to go through it um, operation by operation. What I'm going to do is just highlight this whole subroutine for you, and then we're going to go back and look at a couple things. So notice that left, that bracket along the left, that's another nice feature in Holly where it has identified the entire subroutine and encapsulated it in the bracket. There's a uh, message box call with the well done message in there. We also see another call to a function, wsprintfa. It's going to be a format string in there somewhere. Um, but you also see several little operations that are dealing with single bytes. We're moving a byte into a register, we're dividing it, we're moving some single bytes around. Um, doing a conditional jump, we're doing it again, another conditional jump, we're looking at a static byte there. So chances are this routine is looking byte by byte at the serial number that you provided based on your username and determining whether or not it's valid. So let's just look at the first um, real important code here in the pseudo check algorithm. And that starts right here, and I'm going to highlight down to there. Can everybody see these letters? If not, I'll try to read them off to you. All this stuff appears as setting up the function call, setting up the stack. Um, this one here is the first important one. We're moving hex 10 to a register, to the ECX register. And we're going to actually put a, I'm going to put a break point on that, and we're going to run this and step through it. So let's just go ahead and do that. So I'm going to just put some stuff that I know will be easy to recognize. And I keep wanting to disassemble this. Is okay. So when I hit check, we should hit that break point. And we do. And let me start and do it again because I need to move that out of my way. Not enough real estate. All right. When I hit check. And we've hit our breakpoint, that's the move ECX10. So here's where we start doing that tracing, that stepping through the code. And there are shortcut keys to do it. I'm just going to use the shortcut keys. Um, F7 means to step into, F8 means to step over. And the difference is stepping into means you go into every little nook and cranny and follow it down the rabbit hole as it goes into system DLLs, et cetera. You don't want to do that necessarily in this case with so many F8, it just steps over those calls, but it still executes everything under that call. So the first thing we do, you see the ECX change to 10. So we move something into that register. Then we move 403254. I'm going to right click on that and follow that in the dump. What's 403254? Uh, it's, I'm sorry, I'm going to restart this again because I didn't put my test strings in there. Not that it really matters. We could have worked with that, but it's much easier to use a recognizable test string. So check, I'm going to step F8, that's equal to 10. Now we're moving from this address, let's find it again, follow it in the dump, memory address, and back here. So what do we see here? We see 41, 41, 41, 20, 42, 42, 42, 42. That's obviously the hex um, ASCII codes for our username. So we're taking a byte out of that and putting it into, into one of these registers. And there's 41 up there. Now we're doing a divide. Divide does something interesting. When you're dividing a single byte like that, it puts your quotient here in AL, and it puts your remainder in AH. The next code takes that remainder in AH and puts it in DL. We now have one in DL. The next code, 403235, where is that? I'm going to scroll up a little bit. 403235 is right here. 
They can't see because this is in the way, but there's a strange string of lo what looks to be garbage characters. There are 16 characters there, and that's not coincidental. Our remainder is going to be used as an offset in that string and put that byte that it finds at the offset into AL. So AL, as I step, becomes 41 again. Has nothing to do with our password. It came out of this string. You can see the beginning of it here, one and A. So it's capital A that it picked. That's the first character of our serial number, based on the username A A B B B B. Because it's using that divide and the remainder as part of the algorithm. So stepping through here, it will essentially grab the first byte from our serial number C, capital C, and then it's going to compare the two. And you can see in the little preview pane here, we have an A and a C. It's going to compare them going to set the flags, see the flags that turned red that it set, and we're going to jump and follow that red line because we failed all the way to the bottom, and we're going to return out of that, and we're going to get our wrong serial number code. So to make a long story short, um, I was able to step through this and uh, go through the loops, and what happens is it does this twice. It does that same thing with the division operation twice with the remainder. It then checks for a static 2D value, which is a dash. So it's looking for two characters, then a dash. And then it's looking for what comes out of um, this format string. So it loops through here, this little internal loop, loops through your username, takes all the hexadecimal values, adds them up, and it sends that to a format string, and then zero pads it out to eight bytes long. And that eight bytes becomes the next eight bytes in your serial. It then comes down here, and we're looking for um, oh, it, it does a check, it does another loop that checks through those eight bytes, and then we're looking for another 2D, which is another dash, and it does almost the same thing again, except it uses the last two bytes of your username instead of the first two with that division and the remainder down here at the bottom. And if you get through all of that and you pass all of the byte checks, you get to this, um, and you will not jump and you'll go into your well done message. So, the net result is, from what we've learned, we can take any programming language of our choice. In this case, I've taken Python, very big Python, apparently, and uh, recreated that same algorithm in Python. It's fairly simple. And if I run it, get a username, I'll use Larry Kowalski. Famous, I'm make him famous up here. So Larry, there's your serial number if you ever want to register this program. Um, we'll save it for you, but let's test it out first and make sure it works. Check it. Oh, we stopped at our breakpoint. Well done. There's your serial number. So that's in essence uh, what we would do to reverse a reverse me challenge. So let me get back to my slides here. So here are some of the common APIs. When I told you that one of the methods to, to find your your clues was to break on APIs. These are some of the common APIs you might find in Windows 32. Um, just use that as a, show us the ASCII codes and some parting thoughts. So I don't know if that seemed complex to you. Um, I know it was rushed, but certainly when it comes to reversing challenges and when you get into the real world and start doing malware, you run into a lot more complex stuff than this. This is not complex at all. Some of the things you might run into are anti-debugging techniques, code obfuscation, <coughs> packet uh, executables, and even worse, and Tyler can speak to this probably better than I can, there are really sinister malwares out there that will detect that they're trying to be analyzed and, uh, and attack your analysis machine. So be legal, be safe. Um, here are the references, disclaimer two at the top. If you do Google reverse me's and cracks me, crack me's, somebody else compiled that code, you have no idea what's in it, I suggest you practice in a sandbox virtual machine environment. Same thing if you get into real malware analysis, you want to do it in a contained environment, not on your production machines. 
And if you have any questions, you can contact me offline, or if you want any of these resources, uh, you can do the same. Any questions as I take a breath? Time for a break? Can I get no. a copy of your presentation? Sure. Yeah, I want that page with the calls. Yeah, absolutely. I can do that. Nudge the person next to you, wake them up. It's time for a break. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Just a quick warning if you go outside, the doors are locked, so you'll have to have some.